Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, IFA Hong Kong uh, branch event. And in particular, welcome uh, to our friends from the uh, IFA APIC region, uh, such as um, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, and even New Zealand, and also the uh, IFA European region. Um, that's all call in online. We should have around, in total, uh, 60 participants, uh, either on, online or here in person. Um, if you have any questions online, uh, you can raise them through the chat box. Feel free to do so, um, and we try to answer them. And of course, those people that are here in the room, if you have any questions, you can raise them at all times, and we will have a Q&A at the end. So today's topic is about uh, foreign source income exemption, an update. So why an update? Uh, basically, uh, one year ago, on the 27th of October, 21, we organized a similar IFA Hong Kong event, also with speakers from Malaysia and Singapore and the EU. And we were discussing, of course, the grey listing of Hong Kong and Malaysia by the EU. Because one month earlier, on the 5th of October, both Hong Kong and Malaysia were grey listed by the EU. So for some of us, that development uh, came as a surprise. Um, some already anticipated the issue. Uh, for sure, the Malaysian and the Hong Kong governments were informed on this matter in advance. Uh, whether they agreed with the grey listing as such is, of course, something else. It's not a story. And during that panel uh, session, we discussed, amongst others, uh, what the responses were from the Malaysian and the Hong Kong government at that particular time. And I think the conclusion was in Malaysia that it had the intention to actually completely abolish the offshore regime in Malaysia. Uh, but then it partly backtracked on that uh, after the session, actually a couple of uh, months of weeks after the session uh, we organized. And the Hong Kong government as such was also quite quickly to respond and uh, basically said it would introduce new legislation per 2023. And um, I think Malaysia was thinking about uh, giving their legislation veto effective effect. So now we're almost 2023. So the question is, what has happened in Hong Kong? What has happened in Malaysia since 21? And whether um, Hong Kong, like Singapore, right? how is Singapore coping with this? And whether the EU is actually happy with the final uh, draft legislations um, that's actually Hong Kong and Malaysia has uh, produced. So let me quickly introduce our speakers uh, for today. Um, we decided to keep this introduction short. Um, in Singapore, we have uh, Barbara Foscomp, uh, she's partner, yeah, the lady still in red, yeah. Um, she's partner at Lloyd and Louf, uh, and she's looking for us at the EU perspective. Uh, she was also on the panel one year ago. Um, at the left from her, we have Peter de Ritter, um, partner at Mayor Brown, and he is looking for us at the Singaporean view on uh, these matters. In Malaysia, in the middle down the screen here in Hong Kong, uh, we have Tinish Kana. Uh, partner at Tratax and um, also in conjunction with uh, WTS Global, and he looks at the Malaysian perspective. And not to forget, of course, at the left from me, uh, Joanne E uh, from ENY. Um, she's looking at the Hong Kong perspective. Um, she's also part of the executive committee in Hong Kong, and very important, our WIN representative, a woman in network. So if anybody wants to join her, uh, please let us know. And my name is William Jen Hookland. I'm with HKWJ Tax Law and Partners, and I happen to be the current chair of the IFA Hong Kong branch. So let's start. Um, we just want to start with uh, Barbara. Barbara in uh, Singapore. Um, she will refresh our memories again. Um, basically, what are the exact issues that the EU has, uh, the European Union has with the Malaysian and the and, and Hong Kong current tax systems. Yeah, thank you very much, William Jan. And uh, maybe indeed uh, by way of uh, background and to refresh your memory, what happened uh, till, uh, till today. Um, in uh, 2016, the EU introduced the concept of non-cooperative uh, jurisdictions, which led uh, to the first uh, black and gray list in 2017. 
And why was that? That was mostly to, to, to give a tool to the EU to address tax avoidance, tax fraud and money laundering. Um, in October 2019, the EU published a, uh, guidelines on foreign source income exempt uh, regimes. And in uh, November 2019, uh, there was a code of conduct uh, uh, group uh, uh, established and that was reviewing a list of harmful or uh, alleged harmful uh, regimes. And so why is the EU uh, concerned about this foreign sourced uh, 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 regimes um, and, and, is, and, and what parts of the income and what element of it is what they're particularly concerned about is uh, there where it comes to a foreign sourced passive income that is not that is excluded and uh, 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 foreign sourced uh, regimes that exclude foreign sourced active income uh, from taxations that are not aligned with international tax principles. Well, that's a mouthful, but I'm sure we'll get to more detail when we discuss uh, uh, Malaysia and Hong Kong and to, uh, in a diff slightly different context, uh, Singapore. Because uh, uh, as we all know, in October last year, 2021, uh, both Hong Kong and Malaysia uh, were added to the gray list. And uh, um, uh, uh, the issue uh, that was raised that uh, for uh, Hong Kong, especially corporates without substantial economic activity are not uh, subject uh, to tax uh, on their offshore income. Well, what is the consequences of uh, being on uh, on the on the gray list? Uh, it's actually not so much yet. I mean, it's more of a, a warning shot. Uh, uh, you get like a, a a designated period to adopt and address like the issues raised by by the EU. And so, for uh, both Malaysia and Hong Kong, EU indicated that uh, before the 31st of December of this year, which is like in six, seven weeks, uh, uh, the uh, perceived harmful regime should be abolished and or uh, amended. If that does not happen, uh, then you move to the blacklist and that triggers like a wide range of automatic uh, uh, negative consequences uh, from varying from uh, administrative, uh, uh, um, uh, duck six uh, implications to denial of deductions to increased uh, withholding taxes to applying of uh, CFC rules depending on which member state you're talking about. Uh, so I mean there's a lot uh, of of pressure and uh, uh, to to adopt uh, the regimes uh, timely and duly, and that is where. Uh, we get to, I guess, the actions from both Malaysia and, and uh, Hong Kong in that respect. But this is basically what happened before uh, both Malaysia and uh, Hong Kong uh, 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 started to adopt and think about alternative uh, regimes. Back to you, Willem Jan. Okay, thank you, Barbara. So, um, although this is, of course, about a passive income regime, but Barbara, you are saying that the EU is also looking at active income, right? Yeah, so this is about the passive, but I mean, for the active, there's there's certain uh, active uh, uh, where it comes to active income that is not taxed uh, uh, according to international standards. Okay, great, thank you. So um, moving on, um, uh, Joanne, um, have you solved the problem? Has Hong Kong solved the problem? Okay, big question. Thanks, Willem. Um, so. Uh, let me start by saying um, Hong Kong, I think, is obviously the baby of this fizzy um, movement, let's say. Um, and, you know, obviously Singapore, um, um, like years ahead in Malaysia, has enacted the law. So we literally, I mean, I have the law right in front of me. It's still warm from the printer, um, <laughs> hot off the press. So let me just quote the commissioner's um, words, right, um, when he tabled the, uh, the draft bill um, in front of um, the bills committee, he said there are three objectives to the new FISI regime. Number one, align with international standards. Two, get Hong Kong off the blacklist, you know. Um, and three, potentially the abuse, um, uh, a harmful abuse of the current passive income regime. So, you know, 
clearly stated, understood. So, so what's happened between 2019, um, as Barbara was saying, to today? Now, back in June 2022, just a few months ago, consensus was reached with the EU as to sort of the directional guidelines for the FISI regime. Now, so now I have to commend the IRD and the FSTB because it has been probably a very tough couple of months. You know, June to today, it's only been a few months, but they have come up with a draft consultation paper, a draft bill, and an amendment bill. Um, and, you know, certain points, salient points, I think, from the these three um, documents were, one, the passive, sorry, <clears throat> the participation, um, the participation uh, regime. Um, it, so initially they came up with this 50% rule of the passive income, right? So in other words, if a Hong Kong entity held a underlying subsidiary, um, there was this kind of very difficult rule that said not more than 50% of the underlying income should be passive income. And there was a bit of an uproar because a typical Hong Kong um, organization, let's say m and &E, with outbound investments would typically use uh, intermediate holding company to invest, let's say, overseas. And so, you know, that, you know, a lot of uproar that went away. And in the new draft bill, you know, they've been quite generous hearing stakeholders like myself, I've raised this point twice in various meetings. And so they've actually um, allowed um, uh, a wider participation exemption criteria, um, which is um, the 12 month holding period. So that's much, much easier. And the other one is received in Hong Kong. Um, obviously, what does that mean? Um, so under the draft bill that has been clarified, but it's unfortunately just a copy paste of the Singapore Income Tax Act, right? So um, yeah, and so moving on the amendment bill, just the last point I wanna make is the amendment bill. Now that came as a, a little bit of a shock, I suppose, because I think the IRD was um, quite good in the sense that they tried to carve out excluded entities as good entities, meaning they felt, for example, for preferential tax regimes, certain CTCs that already paid 8.25% and had qualified for economic substance requirements, why would they be required to do, um, uh, you know, be subject to the FISI regime again, because they've already met substance requirements. Um, and so I think they were quite brave in pushing that point across, but um, it was opposed by the EU completely and rejected. Um, and the reasons that EU gave was um, one that no other foreign source income regime has the carve out. And secondly, they felt that was actually open to potential abuse where you might have, for example, a CTC who qualifies for this, um, um, who's carved out, may be inclined, let's say, to do a bit of planning and inject some, let's say, IP income that's not incidental to its business, but then because it's carved out from the um, FISI regime that, that there could be abuse of that system. So I guess in conclusion, I guess the speed and you know, uh, the speed in which this these laws are now being enacted. And just a last point on that is, um, I think the final, uh, so we've been to the bills committee, I think the final LegCo um, approval will be somewhere in mid November. Um, and that, that will be the signing office and sign, final signing, and then it will be effective 1st Jan 2023. So, you know, and the fact that the IRD has clarified what does, um, um, received in mean and participation exemption being broadened and being more flexible has been very, very welcomed. Sure. Um, Malaysia, Tinish, um, have you solved the EU's problem? Um, I think you guys went rather quick in terms of uh, legislation. Yeah, so uh, we had this uh, webinar organized by uh, IFA Hong Kong last year three days before our budget, um, um, you know, at that uh, webinar, I did mention that uh, it's a simple problem, a simple solution would, uh, well, I, I didn't, okay, let me put it this way. A simple solution would resolve, would solve this. And I hope Malaysia doesn't overreact and uh, take this as a revenue raising um, opportunity. Three days later, the budget, that's exactly what they proposed. So they, did a complete uh, removal of foreign source income exemption, saying that all residents would be subject to tax on foreign source income at the time of remittance on all active passive income company individuals. So that, that, is, that is exactly the overreaction that I was afraid that Malaysian government would do, and that's exactly what they did. Um, so I have some slides on that, actually. If the organizer can help to put it up, that'll be very useful. 
Um, so of course that was very um, that was very shocking. So if I can just have the next slide. Uh, okay, so this is this kind of explains the dif different scope, and uh, Malaysia was on practically territorial scope for a very long time because of our exemption on foreign source income. Um, if I can just have the next slide. Yeah, so this is where uh, the scope of the exemption was, um, you know, until 31st December 2021, the Income Tax Act provided an exemption for all kinds of foreign source income that is submitted, except for specialized industry, which is banking, insurance, and air transport. But effective 1st January 2022, we said, no, there's no more foreign source income um, exemption, uh, except for non-residents. As far as residents are concerned, all of it are going to be taxed at the point of remittance. So um, after that, um, we had a series of dialogue with the Ministry of Finance. That uh, announcement was made in October 2021. So throughout November and December 2021, we had a series of dialogue between the tax practitioners and the Ministry of Finance. Um, I think two days before New Year, the Ministry of Finance issued a media statement stating that uh, individuals would be exempt from foreign source income despite the change in law. There would be an exemption pursuant to minister's power. Also, companies would be given an exemption, but only for dividend income. I think we have that on the next slide. Yeah, so uh, oh, this is on the timing difference. If I can just have the next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the, the Ministry of Exemption announcement came in in uh, uh, came in um, on 29th of December 2021. About uh, nine months later, in September 2022, the relevant uh, laws and guidelines were issued, partially in July, partially in September 2022. While the regime is already was already effective from first of September, first of January 2022, so that was a bit of a about six months to nine months period where we were operating in a regime where foreign source income were taxed, and there was an exemption in principle that was announced, but the full conditions and the relevant ministerial order for that exemption was not available until six to nine months into the regime. So, so that's what um, that's what we have done. And uh, right now you could see the, the, the conditions um, that are gazetted as we have now. Um, yeah, for companies, the exemption is only on dividend income. So dividend income would be subjected on the condition that subject to tax in the foreign jurisdiction, and the highest tax rate uh, in that jurisdiction is 15%. Of course, it's very possible for the dividend itself to have been subjected to tax at a low, at a rate lower than 15%. You can still enjoy the exemption provided these two conditions are met. So companies would still be uh, um, taxed on foreign source interest income, foreign source royalty income, foreign source business income, and uh, so on. In fact, even for foreign source dividend, there are still some confusions about uh, multi-tier situations. We know when the when the dividend originates from um, from a third country, and then you have intermediate holding before it reaches Malaysia. Um, where there, there are still some confusion as to um, into which can which country jurisdiction do we apply these two conditions to? Is it the intermediary jurisdiction? or the jurisdictions where the profits originate. So that's for companies. Uh, I think we have the next slide for individuals. Uh, yeah, these are some of the deemed tax uh, paid situations. If I can have the next slide. Yeah, so for individuals, uh, also we, we didn't have a very blanket exemption as we have hoped for. There are some conditions uh, that you know either should tax should have been paid in the in the in the foreign jurisdiction or um, one of these five conditions should have been met you know because of the uh, uh, tax system in the other country so on so forth so if you look at these five conditions some of them are quite broad um, but the, the catch is by having five division 
kind of increases the the attention to compliance uh, matters. So I think um, that's all I have. Right, if I can just have the next slide. Yeah, that's that's about it. So um, as an overall, individuals are in a better um, position. There are exemptions. Uh, um, there is just about administrative thing for companies. We are on a full blown foreign source income uh, tax system, tax at the point of remittance, um, except for dividend for which there are exemptions subject to meeting certain conditions. And uh, of course, there is no grandfathering provision, which means if an interest income was earned five years ago, but remitted into Malaysia in 2022, that would be taxed in, um, that would be taxed in Malaysia on the basis that remittance is a uh, post 1st of January, 2022. So again, a lot of careful uh, attention planning is required um, on that front. One more thing if I may add on is that there is no specific exemption for collective investment vehicles. And that's particularly problematic. And uh, we are also um, having some dialogues on that front. Um, perhaps I uh, rest here. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Tinus. Um, I think in Hong Kong, we did not look at the individual side. Um, but um, you don't in Malaysia have uh, anything um, like an exemption when you have enough um, economic substance? Is, is that not something that the Malaysian government introduced? No, no. Okay, because we, we like to compare systems, right? So, yeah. Um, okay, then yeah. uh, that, that's, uh, that's clear. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, moving on to uh, Peter. Um, so the, the question I raised earlier to you actually is like whether you could address <clears throat> whether Singapore at all, uh, why Singapore was not targeted uh, by the EU, um, but listening to uh, the, um, the measurements in Malaysia and Hong Kong, the new draft legislation, um, would you think that, for example, uh, Singapore is also required to make uh, certain adjustments uh, over time? <clears throat> um, I'm not sure that is necessary, uh, Willem. And the answer to the question is actually an EU question. But if I try to venture an answer based on the sort of criteria that um, <clears throat> the EU uh, applies, um, as Barbara explained in the start, they're looking for transparency, they're looking for robust anti-avoidance uh, legislation, and there should be no administrative discretion in uh, exempting income for the tax, tax authorities. Um, if, if you apply that, that, that those three criteria to the situation of Singapore, I think there's a couple of things that you could observe. One is, if, if you look at the um, Global Forum's OECD peer reports that, that uh, came out in 2019 about the exchange of information on uh, request situations, Singapore came out very favorably in, that, uh, in those peer reports. And that was an OECD report, but I'm sure the EU will also be looking at OECD reports. Um, the other thing to note is that <clears throat> um, Singapore was quite quick in ratifying the MLI. So it ratified it back in uh, 2018. It was well, of, was well before Hong Kong did that. And uh, Malaysia did it in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, to Nash. So Singapore was quick off the block on that topic too, which is important for the anti-avoidance aspects. And then of course, last but not least, it has the uh, receipt provision. It has had it for at least the last four decades in its Income Tax Act. So Singapore has had a, a pseudo territorial tax system for about 40 years now. And um, it's also noteworthy in the EU context that 20 of the 41 tax treaties that Singapore has, and so, uh, which all contain a remittance, a receipt provision, that 20 of those 41 treaties are with EU countries. So if you take it all together, there is little sort of motive for the EU to doubt or to look for situations of double non-taxation where Singapore is concerned, and particularly on, on passive investment income. I think that's where I want, want to stop. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Peter. 
So now we've heard about uh, the different uh, tax jurisdictions, uh, Malaysia and Hong Kong, and of course, also a little bit uh, Singapore and also the uh, point of view uh, from the EU. Um, I just would like to maybe look at certain characteristics of, of, of our uh, systems. So, um, in Hong Kong, for example, we were told um, by the um, RD that um, uh, we would not have any uh, safe harbor systems um, in place uh, for economic substance. Um, basically, the uh, Hong Kong was uh, told that that's actually non done. Um, but at the same time, and I was a bit critical uh, on that matter, um, I find it a little bit uh, unfair, if I may say, because the EU uh, countries have safe harbor rules in place, um, in particular, particular jurisdictions. And um, as far as I remember, even also in Singapore, um, I, I don't think we have safe harbor rules in Malaysia. Is that correct? Because we don't have economic substance requirements. Okay, William, just to just uh, we don't have safe harbor, but just to complete the answer to the earlier question, right? We don't have a broad based economic uh, substance um, 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 carve out of this. But as for the dividend exemption, um, if you didn't actually pay tax because of tax incentive, and if that tax incentive meets substantive criteria, then yes, there is a there is a particular um, but that, that in in such a case, the dividend income may still qualify for foreign source income exemption, but there's no particular safe harbor for that. Sure. So, so my issue is basically, um, if you have a pure equity holding in a lot of jurisdictions, then usually um, the, the government would give some guidance like, okay, you need to have so much turnover, or so, uh, so much salaries needs to be paid out, and then you would have enough uh, substance in that, uh, economic substance in that particular jurisdiction. Um, uh, Joanne, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but uh, my, my, I'm just wondering, where does the government actually get the information otherwise from? Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely true. I think um, we all know that the Pure Equity Whole Co um, ESR, Economic Substance Requirements, are obviously lighter and more reduced. And that's quite common in a lot of the FISI regimes. But just wanted to point out that actually in our submission paper, EY, we actually did push the, uh, um, the IRD and FSTB to, say, to see if they would consider a safe harbor rule, which was, and I'm still getting complaints, similar to you to today by clients who say, look, I'm Hong Kong headquartered. Um, I'm listed in Hong Kong. My business is controlled and managed in Hong Kong. Um, you know, can we have the ESR rules sort of, um, you know, deemed satisfied for the group? And the, and the Hong Kong government, I mean, the IRD and FSTB said no, so it was not incorporated in the bill. So, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's strange. And now I'm hearing, you know, like Singapore has in the EU has it. So I'm kind of a bit mad now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to hear from, um, you know, what are the substance, uh, the safe harbor rules, because it is interesting. It is interesting. It was rejected that um, that submission um, or. Yeah, and they, Peter, they, they, it's correct, right? You have some safe harbor rules in Singapore. Actually, no, Singapore doesn't. I mean, Singapore has economic substance requirements for tax incentive schemes, and it has a sort of economic substance requirement for look-through holding structures, where you'll be looking through intermediary holding companies which don't satisfy the participation exemption criteria. And essentially, I mean, the best you can say about that economic substance condition is that the Singapore holding company should not be what they call a shell company. And a shell company is defined as an entity um, that uh, has some space available to it and um, has an executive director or an executive employee on its payroll. Um, but that's about it. Um, there's no general economic substance principle in Singapore. So let me start off with that. Uh, and, and, and I think in that sense, we're, we're very similar to what Malaysia has. Sure. Okay, um, well, I think uh, sooner or later we will get some uh, type of uh, guidelines on that, I think, because we, we simply uh, probably need them. Um, so moving on about uh, slightly something else, um, we were also told, for example, um, well, once you've got a tax resident, resident certificate in Hong Kong, um, 
or in general, or for text 3D purposes, uh, you would think that you also have a particular type of uh, substance, economic substance um, in Hong Kong. It seems, however, that um, under the current proposal or the comments made by the Hong Kong government is that um, they say that's a, basically a separate issue. Um, it's, it's um, you know, for when you've got a, um, an, an, um, uh, a certificate, that's actually only to decide whether um, that particular resident is a resident uh, or that company is a resident under a treaty. But then the question is, of course, how do you determine that that person has a resident in, in Hong Kong? Um, anything you want to say about that, um, Joanne? Sure. Um, I think there was a slight shift in the IRD and FSTB's position on this because when I had verbal conversations initially and I said, would you consider a, a Hong Kong entity that has successfully applied for COR to meet substance requirements for the FISI regime? And I was told, yes. And then when the law came, I was like, what? It says uh, very clearly on the website that um, it's there's no negotiation. It is completely two concepts. It's just because you met the substance requirement for CRR does not mean you meet it for the foreign source income exemption regime. And I almost feel that it's because from a technical standpoint, it's really hard to align the two. Like Because obviously with CORs, you're looking at a set of strategic decisions, maybe even financing and what have you. And then with the foreign source exemption regime, depending on the source of income, interest or dividend or royalties, again, it's a different sort of rules. So I think for them to say, if you met the conditions for the COR, you would meet it for the FISI regime, they would probably get into a bit of a technical uh, conundrum. I would say that would be the word, yeah. I think anyway, because there was a shift in my view. Uh, Barbara, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that as well, whether you would have any. Yeah, um, yeah no, no, no. I mean, I, I, I think I'd like to go back to, to Joanne's uh, remark that it is a bit unfair that in the EU context there is uh, is uh, safe uh, safe harbors. And I, I think it's good to realize that that, I mean, within the EU, we have this love-hate relationship with like harmonizing uh, tax concepts. And I mean, there's all these different member states. So, I mean, if we if we sort of, if we as EU, I mean, because this is clearly EU uh, uh, a guideline, say this is a safe harbor and this is free. I mean, so that obviously has a spillover effect to the different member states and I mean, to the EU itself. So I think, I mean, that part what you were raising that it's unfair has like a clear, uh internal eu component to to it uh so so um uh, that as a side remark to that it may be a little bit unfair but that is just member state uh, specific um that's nothing against hong kong or or malaysia to that uh, to that matter as to the cor i don't think that i think that's more of a a hong kong or malaysia or singapore uh a matter not so much a eu angle to that um, thank you, Barbara. Um, <clears throat> what about uh, preferential uh, tax regimes? Uh, how, how would that fit in uh, within the uh, foreign source income uh, exemption regime? Uh, Joanne? So essentially, um, they have actually, in the amendment bill, just I think last Thursday, wasn't it? Not even a, on Friday, not even a week ago, um, the amendment bill basically carved out um, preferential tax regimes. Um, I'm sorry, no, let me backtrack. So the IRD um, wanted to have to carve out excluded entities being, you know, those that qualified for the preferential tax regimes. And essentially, the EU said no, um, because, you know, as I said, I think earlier on in the intro that um, they, they saw potential to, uh, you know, for companies like a CTC who may actually be able to, if they were carved out from the Fizzy regime, then they could perhaps, let's say, plan it so that they would um, book income, let's say, from IP that was actually not um, in line or with the trade and profession and business they were carrying out, but still get away with it because it'd be undetected. So I think the, you know, potential for abuse of that was um, was uh, yeah was high until 
yeah, basically they've not allowed it. Um, I think the um, um, the thinking is to go from a um, uh, you know actually to go to a kind of excluded income approach in Hong Kong, uh, but actually we learned today um, in in Singapore. Or I learned a little bit early on. Um, that uh, this is actually a kind of luxury position, uh, Peter, because you don't have this carve out system, right? That's right, William Jan. The uh, um, incentivized companies are subject to the same territorial tax principle as, as non incentivized companies in Singapore. So there's no difference there. Um, of course, you've got some cases where there's a tax incentive that gives you a tax holiday where there's no income tax at all. But where they are enjoying a reduced tax rate, which is the majority of the tax incentive scheme in Singapore, those, those tax incentive companies are still subject to the same offshore, onshore rules as non-incentivized companies. So there's no difference. Sure. Um, uh, Tinis in Malaysia, is there, is there anything uh, about written in the legislation? Would, Singapore, would Malaysia um, take care of uh, special regimes in, within the uh, foreign source income exception regime? Yeah, so it kind of leaves it, interestingly, it kind of leaves it to the substance requirement of the originating country uh, for the dividend income, uh, right? It kind of leaves it to the substance requirement um, and it doesn't say that uh, we would, so if the preferential regime fulfills the substance requirement um, um, of the jurisdiction from which the income originates, then we will take it at, at that. So we, even though we started off with the wrong footing um, in, in, in last year, October, I think by the time the regulations were out, we were quite clear in our mind that um, as in we, as in the tax professionals and the authorities, that we are not going after uh, genuine tax incentives and so on. And it's also, it's only for, um, um, the, the idea was to indirectly to capture um, low tax uh, intermediate jurisdictions and so on, but not for legitimate exemptions and preferential regimes. Okay, thank you. So we, we discussed actually dividend, uh, maybe also interest in um, uh, capital gains uh, type of income, but the income we haven't discussed yet is actually intellectual property income. And um, in Hong Kong, with regard to uh, for a source IP income, uh, we will um, get a kind of uh, nexus requirement. Um, and that will only be in introduced for uh, qualifying um, intellectual property being uh, patents and uh, copyright. Um, so what, what maybe it's not so much of a tax question, but what bothered me somehow here is that when you talk about patents and uh, software copyright, uh, I mean, that is normally generated by um, uh, plants, right? Big, big companies. Uh, Hong Kong and uh, Singapore are rather small. So um, the likelihood that we are getting patents for, um, well, getting income for patents and software copyrights uh, is, is a little bit smaller, although I understand that the qualifying expenses can come from everywhere. Um, but I feel like certain IP are no longer qualified as uh, exempt, right? So it's design or trademark income. Um, are we not, um, it, well, extra penalized uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore by having these type of restrictions in place? Uh, maybe, Joanne? Yeah, so I'll start with, uh, so IP structuring, by the way, is something that I love doing, so I could spend a whole day talking about this topic. <laughs> yeah, I'm boring. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, so this IP um, regime actually is the least um, easy to structure. So the others, the dividends or um, um, what have you, the, um, you know, capital gains, or there's, there's ways to sort of, you know, plan, let's put it that way. For this one, it is a little difficult um, to maneuver because obviously the Nexus approach is so different from what was in the past for the offshore regime as relates to licensing and sublicensing, um, you know, where we looked at um, totality of facts, proprietary interests, you know, licensing, sub it's the, all that sort of like still there, obviously, but with this fizzy and the nexus approach, number one, the IP class of assets 
qualifying IPS is, is so restricted now. Um, you know, it's patents and possibly qualifying software, as William was saying. And then this nexus ratio thing where you look at your qualifying R&D over the total R&D expenses. And again, when you think R&D expenses that qualifies to be, you know, like people in lab coats doing engineering and all that. So all the kind of things of the past that we used to be able to, I guess, attribute to IP regime, licensing income, or your marketing intangibles, trademarks, copyright, trade names, brand names, all that is no longer qualified. So, I mean, I was a bit disappointed to see this, and I actually feel that that really will completely disadvantage Hong Kong when it comes to, you know, wanting to be the next IP hub. And obviously, we hear the government talk a lot about making Hong Kong the next IP hub. But I did hear that, you know, the Hong Kong government is now thinking, so the IRD and FSDB are now thinking about a patent box regime similar to Singapore. Um, but also something that we learned today from Peter, I think when we were talking was apparently Singapore doesn't even have this uh, potential, you know, like for example here, if you qualify under this Nexus approach, you would be exempted. Apparently that's quite special, Peter says. So I, I thought it was bad, but apparently it's still better than Singapore. Is that correct? <laughs> Um, I mean, if I can jump in there, yeah, that's correct what Joanne is saying. I would actually consider it uh, quite generous of, for Hong Kong that, uh, that you get an exemption, because not many countries give you an exemption for that IP income, even in the modified nexus uh, situation. Uh, Singapore at best gives you a tax incentive if you meet the substance criteria for the incentive. And, and then you get a 5 or 10% tax rate, but you don't get a tax exemption. Thank you, Peter. So it's not all too bad in Hong Kong. I think that's the message that's being brought uh, out here today. Um, moving on just quickly to the um, uh, participation exemption uh, that's been introduced in Hong Kong. Uh, if you don't have enough uh, economic substance, you get a second chance. Um, you can try if you uh, qualify for the um, uh, participation exemption. Uh, that's for dividends and, and capital gains. Um, <clears throat> it, the, the something that bothered me here was um, the, sort of the the, the the rule is actually there needs to be a headline tax of 50%. I saw in Malaysia that's actually uh, the same type of requirement. Um, but how does it work in practice? Because when I read the question and answer um, guidelines from the uh, RED, it, it seems like if you have three jurisdictions uh, from where dividend comes from. And then one of the jurisdiction um, has a um, tax rate of below 15%. Um, do you need then to um, apply the credit methods and uh, assume that the other types, uh, the other two entities do have a headline tax of 50% or more. So the, 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 the income is actually pulled into one entity, right? Uh, the dividend income, uh, two types of the in dividend income is a tax at 50%. One type is uh, taxed at a lower percentage rate. Um, Hong Kong says then that you need to apply a credit method first. But do you need to apply the credit method to then all the types of income or just only for that income uh, of which the headline tax was below 50%? I, I don't think, Joanne, you've got a, maybe an answer to that, but um, I can try. No answer to that, but the, 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 the uh, do you want to say something, dear? The, the point, the point, the point, the point here is simply, um, and of course, maybe that's because the, the legislation is not a uh, draft is sharp enough or uh, clear enough. But what if a Hong Kong entity gets income from a uh, different income from three different jurisdictions? One jurisdiction has a tax rate of lower than fifty percent. Um, do you need to apply then the uh, credit method uh, first over all the income received or only for that type of income that uh, was below 15%? Um, we don't have an answer to that, but I think that's something uh, we might need to look into. Would you like, would be Jerry okay to? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I sort of had the answer to that, but he'll do a better job explaining it. <laughs> Hi, hello everyone, it's Jerry. Uh, I'm also helping Joanne on... <laughs> 
on this. So uh, if just uh, on a scenario, on example, just William just mentioned that one jurisdiction, you got a tax rate lower than 15%, then, then I think the, the, from the uh, literal interpretation from the, uh, from the draft bill, then it's simply saying that in this case, the participation exemption won't work. So basically, you 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 can just say, oh, I, I apply credit on that portion I fail, but you need to apply the credit method for the entire in, for the entire uh, dividend income. So because because basically the participation exemption won't work now. So and so long as so if you also fail to satisfy the economic substance requirement, then basically your income will be subject to tax. And the only way you you get a you get you get some relief would be the the, the tax uh, credit. Thank you. Um, can we learn something from Singapore here? Uh, Singapore, you'll be looking at it per per subsidiary paying the dividend or per company paying the dividend. And those cases which do not qualify under the participation exemption would be so long as you hold at least 25% of the shares, unless a tax treaty uh, gives you a lower threshold. Um, if, but um, you will be, able, you'll be entitled to claim a credit for both the foreign dividend tax and the underlying profits tax um, for that particular dividend. So it's not all or nothing, but it's you're looking at those dividends which don't qualify under the participation exemption. Okay, thank you. Um, then one of um, another question actually is uh, a very basic question maybe, but how much is really, um, of course, I, I think when I listen to what is going on in Hong Kong compared to maybe some of the other jurisdictions here, we're not doing too bad, but I still have to raise the question maybe to Joanne because um, how much is, do you feel still left of our territorial system? Um, that's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, because, I mean, the IRD has, has in its website um, have one example where obviously there is a, a nice link between um, the offshore territorial system and FISI. So the, the example they gave was if a company was, um, you know, making a simple loan of money, derives offshore interest income uh, using a provision of credit tests, then Clearly, in, from that perspective, it meets um, the offshore territorial system. But at the same time, if strategic decisions are made in Hong Kong, it also qualifies under the participation, uh, the, the um, um, sorry, what was it? Non pure holding equity, uh, non pure equity whole co requirement as well for the economic substance. So, meaning it fulfills both. But, and that's so simplistic. It does for that example but it may not be for other examples. So if you just expand that example slightly to say, well, what if there's intra-group financing? What if there's other sort of money lending activities? And then you use the totality of facts or operations test approach, then it really doesn't quite link or sync with the FISI regime um, because they're saying the strategic decisions must be made in Hong Kong, right? For you to meet the economic substance requirements on the FISI, but that might fall foul of the totality of facts operations test approach, meaning it might be onshore income. So it's sort of like, I don't know, but you know, I think the, it's a yes or no. Yeah. Um, um, uh, Tinish, what is the feeling in, in Malaysia on that? Uh, in terms of, uh, do the people feel that the uh, territorial regime uh, has now been uh, largely impacted? Of course, of course, especially for companies uh, and uh, collective investment vehicles and so on, right? Um, I mean, we, we, we always say that we, we, we always had derived a remittance basis as our legal basis, and then we always had a broad exemption in the law, and we were effectively in a territorial scope for decades, which has now just... Um, um, I mean, this is not just an exemption, right? It's kind of changed the design of the tax system altogether, if you like, um, especially for companies. 
Yeah, sure. And one, sorry, just to, just to add on to that, one more thing is that uh, even for individuals, the exemption is only for five years. So if the minister decides not to continue the exemption after five years, then there you go. So we have kind of moved away from territorial scope already. That's very clear. Sure. Thank you. Very clear. Um, and the 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 um, and maybe um, Tinish, I, I stay with you, but. In Hong Kong, I felt that the um, the general uh, consultation process with the Hong Kong government and the stakeholders actually was pretty good, if I may say. Uh, we had quite a few meetings. Um, uh, we've been uh, receiving regular updates from the Hong Kong government. Uh, we could provide comments and suggestions. Uh, um, and uh, although it was quite clear, I think that our government, uh, their hands were quite uh, tight. Um, but what about the Malaysia? Was there much discussion with stakeholders and, and the government? Yeah, there were a lot of discussions. There were a lot of discussions, in fact, uh, presented directly to the minister himself also. But the problem was um, all this took place, um, well, a substantial part of it, I, I would say all the substantial part of it took place after the announcement to put an end to the territorial system was made. So oh, oh, part of the damage was already done. Then we kind of had a lot of discussions to correct it. So, so we had, as an overall, we had a lot of discussions. Um, you know, I, I always felt that uh, personally, at least first of January, 2022 was really a wrong start date. Um, and there were a lot of announcements and consultation after the announcement, so that could have been better managed. But uh, a lot of our opinion were taken into account, were reflected into the law. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. That that's great. So it's a little bit similar experiences in the, in uh, Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> what is still quite unique, I thought, in Hong Kong was that we were able, or still able. Um, to ask for a uh, so-called commissioner's uh, opinion. That's not a ruling, uh, because rulings you only can ask when the legislation is in force. It's just uh, between now and the end of this, uh, well, this year, uh, you can go to the government and ask for um, whether or not your structure has actually basically enough uh, economic substance. So maybe just a question to the public here. Um, does anybody have any particular experience with, with uh, I know it's short, but anybody, uh, any partic particular experience with these commissioner rulings? Uh, did you submit it for your clients? Would you suggest to do this for your clients? Joanne? My, my take from the government, uh, the FSTB or conversations with the IRD is I think they're very open to receiving these um, um, opinions, because I think, you know, they themselves feel that there's so much unknowns, if you like, right now, with the interpretation of a number of things. Um, and I think they'll be quite open and positive. Um, I think some of my clients have said, well, you know, there's not many days between now and 31st of December. And secondly, the IRD are also moving offices. <laughs> So it's sort of like, well, you know, and then it's Christmas holidays and, you know, so it's sort of like, well, you know, is it practical? So I think, I think that is, is, has been some points raised that the timing is too short and with everything coming up, you know, is it plausible to get in a submission and then get an opinion back within a short frame of time? Yeah, it's going to be challenging. So let's um, move to the end. Um, question is actually what brings the future? Um, we have um, draft legislation in Hong Kong. We have existing legislation in uh, Malaysia. Um, uh, Barbara, can we assume that the EU is relatively happy what uh, our countries have put forward? And uh, maybe you can also say something about the uh, monitoring process and uh, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Well, happy. I mean, in EU context, is uh, I mean, it's a difficult uh, theme, I guess, nowadays. But uh, uh, but surely, I mean, I guess that they achieved uh, um, what what they were looking for. At least, I mean, uh, the first steps in that direction. I guess the 
the, the gray and black list, I mean, it's good to mention that that for the, since it since it was enacted, it's always been sort of a musical chair. So, I mean, there's countries going in, out from gray list to black list and then back to gray list. So so uh, I'm sure this is not the, the very end of, uh, of that uh, uh, musical uh, uh, game. Um, but I mean, it is a bit of a technical uh, uh, discussion, but um, in uh, EU has stipulated that uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, assumed uh, harmful regime should be abolished or amended by the end of this calendar year. I mean, it's it, it's a technical matter whether that is in fact the case by the end of uh, the year. And I mean, what it, would that mean that automatically you flip from gray to blacklist on the first of uh, a gen if it is not fully in place. Um, uh, I, I know lots of private equity funds who are super concerned about, uh, about that. Um, having said that, I mean, it is a standing practice that uh, the new gray and black list are announced in February. And so likely you'll see like movements uh, there. And so far, it's never been the case that uh, uh, for that interim period of uh, a gen, uh, um, uh, uh, there's a retroactive uh, perspective or effect to to um, to to the non uh, non being compliant. Um, so the the future, uh, um, likely, uh, hopefully, they will be uh, off the grade off the gray list as from uh, on the new gray list of, of uh, as from February, and then uh, let's see what uh, what's in play going forward. This is all from EU perspective very difficult to assess without looking at the EU context itself. I mean, there's obviously, I mean, mostly left wing. Pressure in in EU say that there's quite some EU countries itself who should be on the blacklist. I mean, and uh, 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 that topic has so far not been uh, in addressed. This is mostly looking outwards. So and and then there's like all the other issues that are uh, on the agenda of the EU presidency that uh, is rotating every uh, six months uh, and some jurisdictions have these items higher on their agenda than other jurisdictions. So never a dull moment from an EU perspective, I would say. Sure, thank you. Um, of course, the Hong Kong government hopes that uh, we will uh, not uh, being blacklisted and that we will uh, uh, go to the normal list. Um, to a non-list. Um, Tunis, if I maybe ask you one of the last questions, but uh, Malaysia already has the legislation in place since last year. It, it, was there any feedback from the EU? I, I suppose that uh, it has no reason to remain in the grey list, I suppose. Uh, in fact, there's already been overreaction, if you like. Uh, but I have not really checked whether the, that's officially reflected or not yet. Not yeah, because it concerns me a little bit, right? You already have new legislation in place for one, more than one year, and um, there's not there hasn't been really much of an update. Um, I think Hong Kong hopes, of course, for to get a quick update in February, but maybe that won't be the case. Final question to all the demo members. Um, the, the, just to, sorry, just to add on to that, right? To be fair, right? The the even though the I would say the complete legislation kind of came in at the very 29th, 30th September of this year, something like that. Because otherwise, even if you want to update EU, you kind of say that, look, I have amended my law and then I have an announcement for exemption, but the law on the exemption and the guidelines for that uh, are not ready to be given until, until um, end of September or beginning of October. So if you if you kind of want to calculate the timeline, it should be from there rather than from January 2022, I think. Yeah, sure. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> final question, um, which is always, I think, a rather funny system because we always uh, wonder that uh, uh, question. Um, maybe Tinius can go first, then maybe um, Barbara, you can also say something. Uh, she will, of course, and, and Peter, and then maybe Joanne. Um, which of the tax systems do you think is uh, most competitive? <laughs> is the best? I don't know if you can say anything about it, won't say something about it, but. Who's first? 
Tinish? Go first, Peter. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I think it, what, it depends on what you want to achieve. Um, um, different investors have different uh, goals, different preferences, though that often there are sometimes uh, quite a bit of overlap. Um, but at the end, end of the day, different, um, different uh, companies, different investors have different preferences. And, um, and each jurisdiction has a different flavor to offer. So what works? The, you know, for, for company A, Malaysia may be, may be the most competitive. For company B, Hong Kong may be the most competitive. For company C, Singapore may be the most competitive. Depends on what you want to achieve and uh, the profile and, uh, you know, even things like whether is it a growing business or stagnant business and all of that. Sure, I, I don't think it's a very fair question anyway. But uh, Peter, do you want to say anything? Diplomatic answer. <laughs> Indeed. If I try to sort of generalize things, because I agree with the national, you need, really need to look at each specific situation. But generally, very sort of generalizing it, I think actually Hong Kong is probably going to be one of the most competitive tax systems of the three jurisdictions that we're discussing here, because of the economic substance exemption, which you don't have in either Malaysia or Singapore. So if you would have sufficient economic, if you have sufficient economic substance in Hong Kong, as of January 1 next year, you would have a tax exemption on that foreign uh, investment income. And that is not a thing that you will have in Singapore. So I think Hong Kong would score high for most competitive jurisdiction, tax jurisdiction. Barbara, do you want to say something? Yeah, well, I mean, I, if, I mean, I if you'd asked me this question like 10 years ago, probably I'd say, well, none of the none of the three would definitely be the Netherlands. But uh, nowadays I'd say uh, probably Singapore. Okay. Joanne? Um, it's a difficult one. Actually, I wasn't expecting the question, so I didn't quite prepare. Always be prepared for that. Okay. <laughs> Must have missed the question on my list. Um, I, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm gonna have to say Hong Kong. Um, <laughs> no booze, no booze. <laughs> Hong Kong, because I think similar to what Peter was saying. I mean, I myself, um, I mean, actually learned something tonight as well when we were comparing the different systems. And you know, I had um, obviously didn't like um, the new foreign source income exemption regime. I thought it came a bit quick, but you know, there were there are ways to structure around the dividend, capital gains, and um, interest ones. And with IP, I thought it was very restrictive. Then, you know, learning from Peter, they don't even have that, you know, potential exemption in Singapore. So I'm leaving this session feeling slightly more positive. And I hope <laughs> many of you today here are as well. So that's that's for me. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I think there's no perfect system, by the way. I think grass is uh, nowhere really green. That's something I learned over time. Um, I just want to thank all the uh, panel speakers, uh, Tinish, Barbara, uh, Joanne, and Peter. Thank you very much. Um, we also want to thank, of course, uh, EY for their uh, facilities. Uh, this is a great room. Thank you for that. Um, we have drinks and snacks afterwards. Those people that still want to go for dinner after the drinks and snacks, uh, they can go to Michael. Michael is in charge of the dinner. <laughs> he, sh he shakes his head. And, um, and of course, I hope to see everyone else uh, that is in Hong Kong at our upcoming uh, Christmas cocktail drink on the 29th of November. And of course, uh, at our upcoming Yin event uh, called the Tax and Law of Virtual Assets in the Metaverse, a Hong Kong perspective. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Hong Kong for inviting us. Mm.